John Travolta tripled sales of white suits in the 1970s, with his hip-thrusting turn as Tony Monero in the disco classic Saturday Night Fever, and electrified a generation of teenage girls as Danny Zuko in the big screen musical Grease, before enduring a decade of flops in the 80s and early 90s. He proved his resilience and hitched his way home from oblivion on the back of Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction in 1994, a comeback that didn't surprise his Pulp Fiction co-star, Harvey Keitel. The guy just exudes a certain joyfulness that is contagious. You feel good being around him. He's one of the most entertaining actors I've ever seen. John was born in New York City, the youngest child in a large middle-class family. His father was a football player turned salesman, and his mother an actress and singer who became a teacher. John got into music and acting early, and one of his first roles was as part of the touring company of Greece. In his late teens, he moved to L.A., and the 1970s were to prove hugely successful for the actor. He played Vinny in the popular TV sitcom Welcome Back Cotter, and then came his breakthrough hit Saturday Night Fever in 1977. Many years later, John acknowledged the impact the film had on his career. That was the first film um, that marked, kind of put me on the map, you know. I had done a movie called Carrie prior to that, but I think Saturday Night Fever was the one that solidified the, the idea that I could, I could stay. In 2005, an exhibition called Disco, A Decade of Saturday Nights opened at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts. It celebrated the Saturday Night Phenomenon, which had garnered the 24-year-old John Travolta a nomination for an Oscar. The real cultural significance of the disco period came into being with Saturday Night Fever, because before that it was a very underground, gay, uh, minority kind of thing, secret little clubs and all. But when it, as soon as uh, Saturday Night Fever became a film, then everybody wanted to be a part of it. That's what made Studio 54 succeed. The following year, John was cast in the hit musical Grease, alongside the Australian Olivia Newton-John. Not only did the film give him another chance to bust some serious moves, it also showcased his great singing voice. In 1998, Paramount released a remastered version of the film, and the stars reunited on the red carpet. For John, it felt like a lot of water had passed under the bridge. Well, it does feel like 20 years, i got to tell you. It doesn't feel like a short period of time. It feels like it was done a long time ago. But more than that, I think it's important that the kids get to see it on the big screen, because our generation... Uh, for a year got to see it and that was the last time it was ever seen on the big screen. So why shouldn't, you know, all the generations since get to see it on the big screen? I, I think it's a good thing. John has continued his friendship with his co-star and in 2006 he presented Olivia with her Lifetime Achievement Award at the Gadea Lay Australia Week Gala. He was invited back just two years later, this time to honor Australian chanteuse Kylie Minogue, who confesses that Grease is still her favorite film. John was on hand to present Kylie with her Excellence in Entertainment Award. However, he was quick to dispel rumors that he'd be joining Olivia in a duet. No. Do a duet. I will not tonight. I am not, I've not rehearsed. Now, if I rehearsed, I would do it, but I didn't re get a chance to rehearse it, so I think it'll be Olivia entertaining all of us. John's career post Greece entered a very frustrating phase of flops and missed opportunities, and it wasn't until Pulp Fiction came around in 1994 that his luck finally turned. Since then, he hasn't looked back. He's gone on to prove himself as a dramatic actor, but it's his comedy work that has struck the biggest call with his fans. In the 1996 film Michael, produced and directed by the Efron sisters, he played an archangel who pulls off earthly miracles when least expected. I like to dance in character, so I like to choose my dances to reflect the image of the character. You know, like 
Pulp Fiction, you know, kind of a uh, hitman dance number. And this is, you know, an, an angel that is kind of overweight and funny. You know? In 2005, he reprised the role of Chili Palmer, who he first played 10 years earlier in Get Shorty. His portrayal of the lovable mobster had won him a Golden Globe Award for Best Performance. In the sequel, Be Cool, Chili gives up on the movies and takes on the music industry. And John understood what made Chili so cool. Well, I think... Uh you know, Chili loved all the classic cool characters like, um, you know, Sean Connery and Bond or Brando or Dean or, you know, I, I think that it's innate in him to, to be Cary Grant, you know, to be all those guys. Because he loves movies, he loves music. Two years later, John was all over big screen comedy. In Wild Hogs, he played one of four middle-aged suburbanites who take to the road on their Harley Davidsons in an attempt to recapture their youth. He bonded closely with his co-leads, Tim Allen, William H. Macy, and Martin Lawrence. No, it was more uh, jokes at each other's expense, uh, that kind of thing. Although, one time, I got so mad at Tim because he kept on rev He had no muffler on his bike, so it was deafening. I mean, like it will puncture your eardrum. And he would do it, and he would do it antagonistically. He'd look at you, and he'd rev it, and look at you again, and rev it. And you'd just say, P Sam, please. I mean, uh, Tim, please. And he, when he did, wouldn't stop, I took my bike, and I started to bang his bike on the back of his wheel. And I, I banged him in a circle. And every time he did that, I did that. So it was the only thing that shut him up, you know, with the bike. And it worked. At the Spanish premiere, the star, who's had his fair share of ups and downs, offered up his own down-to-earth recipe for getting through difficult times. As often as possible escaped uh, on ventures and adventures, uh, before fame and during. Uh, so I think it's one of the, the great pleasures in life is running away and uh, with friends, family, and uh, and having a, a great a weekend, a great uh, vacation, uh, it balances the, um, the whole portfolio of one's life. In the same year, John thought long and hard about whether to take on one of the biggest challenges of his career, the role of Edna Turnblatt in the remake of the John Waters musical, Hairspray. Honestly, I would have hesitated with any musical because I think they're a, a difficult, genre to conquer. So I think I wanted to know everybody was on their A game. I wanted to know uh, what barriers I had and limits I had as an actor uh, to perform it. He made some very specific demands before accepting the role. And once they agreed that I could play it fully as a woman and not as a, you know, in drag or as a man, then I, I said, okay, well that could challenge me as an actor and I'll do that because that's, that, that's just, what I do, that's what my job is. But the part of the all-singing, all-dancing 1960s suburban housewife was about to take him way out of his comfort zone. It was going out on a limb. You know, I had been a macho leading man for 30 years and, you know, wow, you know, you're gonna go here? And, uh, and I thought, well, that you're an actor and that's what you do and commit to it. And so in committing to it, I, uh, I realized that if I did it well enough, it, it, it could be acknowledged as, a, as a, a, a good thing. Not only did he have to shift gender convincingly, John also had to don a fat suit, and he admitted that the daily routine was rather grueling. Well, it's difficult. It was five hours of work to get into it, uh, but once I was in it, I was committed, and. Uh, I looked forward to singing and dancing because it took my attention off of having it on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Was it hard to sing and dance? I mean, how much did it weigh? I don't, well, I mean, I, I, I played football, so I was used to wearing equipment. <laughs> so it didn't bother me so much to have the extra weight uh, as much as it did the heat uh, containment. You know, no breathing uh, areas, you know. At least this time, he wasn't forced to slim down for the cameras which he doesn't mind admitting can be a pretty daunting prospect. Cary Grant said, if you want to keep your figure, you have to forget the whole idea of food 
Just throw it out the window. That's it. Now this went over like a ton of bricks for me because I like food so much, but you cut to 20 years later when I got to be friends with the second generation of Hollywood film actors, which included a close uh, friendship with Marlon Brando, and his advice was to eat whatever I wanted. <laughs> and of course, I much preferred that. Hairspray ended up being a popular and critical success, and John earned a Golden Globe nomination for Best Supporting Actor and a Screen Actors Guild Award nomination for Outstanding Performance. Aside from his long-lasting career in comedies and musicals, John has also made a name for himself as a serious actor, thanks to a string of successful thrillers. In 1997, he starred opposite Nicolas Cage in the action-packed John Woo film Face Off. John played an FBI agent in a high-tech game of cat and mouse with his longtime adversary. In a unique twist, the two men adopt each other's faces and personalities, a process which demanded great communication between the actors. I think it's probably the first time that two actors really had to collectively or collaboratively to ch choose how to play characters. We had to ask permission of, of each other of what we could do or what we, we couldn't do. And uh, I found that very, very interesting. And actually, uh, in a way, refreshing. Because then it didn't become about just you. It became about a bigger, you had to be responsible for the other. But God, I hope Nick is okay if I do this. In 2003's Basic, a film about the art of warfare, John was reunited with his sidekick from Pulp Fiction. Samuel Jackson played a drill instructor who goes missing, while John portrayed the DEA agent brought in to investigate the cover-up. In promoting the film, John revealed what made him choose to sign up to the project. It was the script first, and the character second, and then Sam, and the director, and Connie, and all that wonderful, those wonderful supporting actors that the totality of that is what drew me to the script. The next year he stepped into the shoes of a firefighter by playing Baltimore Fire Chief Mike Kennedy in Ladder 49. The film followed Kennedy's brigade over a period of eight years and involved a lot of difficult stunt work. John found some of the real-life scenarios challenging. Well, fortunately, the first time I had to confront fire, I had my equipment on. But unfortunately, the first time I had to confront fire, confront fire the, the room was so filled with smoke I couldn't see. So I knew I was protected, but I also knew I couldn't get out because I had lost uh, place of the hose. And uh, fortunately, a flicker of flame shone upon a, a hose in the distance, and I grabbed onto it, and I followed it out. And then I threw my hands up and said, I don't know how you guys do this. You know. In the same year, he joined the growing ranks of actors who starred in popular comic book adaptations. And for once, he got to play the bad guy. In The Punisher, based on the Marvel comic series, his character was Howard Saint, a socialite Florida businessman who hides a deeply malevolent side. It was the darkest role he'd ever played. It was classic in that it was high-end evil. You know what I mean? It was uh, this guy being hoity and kind of a blue blood wannabe and you know he, he thinks he's got good money but it's all bad money you know and uh, it's more fun to play that. His co-star Thomas Jane found John almost too easy to work with. It was fun yeah he's a, he's a he's a great guy really great guy he's a wonderful man very gregarious funny uh, collaborative good looking I want to kill him you know so I wanted to beat the out of him. John's third film for the year offered him a very different challenge. A love song for Bobby Long was an independent picture in which he played the title role, a former literature professor who's fallen on hard times. He hoped that his big star appeal would encourage audiences to see the film. It deserves it. And uh, the writing 
You, you don't get this kind of writing on a big budget movie. They won't do it. You have to go out on a limb to get something like this done. You have to be able to do it for no money, and you have to be able to support it in hopes that critics and journalists uh, and awards will like it. And that's all on the come, mm -hmm. do you know? Mm -hmm. But it deserves it. it. It's, we haven't, we need messages like this. We need, we need people to be entertained by the classic concepts. It doesn't happen anymore. And it's lovely when it does. Despite the obvious differences between them, John could personally relate to his down and out character. I understand the, the comfort of having people that you love live with you and you wake up when you feel like it and um, conversation is, is the adventure of the day. Alongside his on-screen performances, John has also been enjoying a career behind the camera as a voice actor. In the 2008 animated children's film Bolt, he played a dog who had to be persuaded that he wasn't a superhero by a kitten called Mittens, played by Hannah Montana star Miley Cyrus. The duo wrote and sang the song I Thought I Lost You, which was nominated for a Golden Globe Award for Best Original Song. Acting and singing are just two strings in John Travolta's impressive bow. He's also a professional pilot and the proud owner of five aircraft, including a Boeing 707-138 airliner called Jet Clipper Ella after his two children. In 2002, the self-professed airline geek was named ambassador at large for the Australian airline Qantas after training on 747 simulators in order to earn his wings. He was keen to encourage nervous patrons back into the air after the terrible tragedy of 9-11. The airlines uh, need some support and positive thinking at this time uh, because I still think that the airlines offer the most amazing way to communicate, to transport and and for business and personal reasons around the world, so we have to eventually turn it around. And uh, I think that uh, injecting a spirit of friendship along the lines of the, the, the themes that Qantas already brings to, to life is a, is a good thing. After Hurricane Katrina decimated the Gulf Coast in 2005, John flew his private jet to the area to deliver food and medical supplies. Another of the actor's great passions is Scientology, and alongside other Hollywood stars like Tom Cruise and Kirstie Alley, he is always prepared to stand up for the unusual and often disparaged religion. Founded by writer L. Ron Hubbard in the mid-20th century, Scientology holds many controversial beliefs, including the idea that psychiatry is evil. In the year 2000, he put his money where his mouth was and proved his commitment to Scientology by starring and producing, as well as part financing the movie, Battlefield Earth. Based on the science fiction novel of L. Ron Hubbard, it ended up being a critical and commercial flop, with John reportedly losing his entire $11 million stake. Not that that setback affected his faith. In 2006, he and his wife Kelly appeared at the Scientology 37th Annual Celebrity Center Gala. Well, I've been part of Celebrity Center for 31 years this year. And um, so every year is a celebration for me because when I found Celebrity Center, I found uh, my life again. John's home life has been remarkably stable when viewed alongside many of his Hollywood peers. He married fellow actor Kelly Preston in 1991, and the couple had two children, Jet and Ella. In 2007, he spoke to the press about their wish for a larger family. Yeah, hopefully at, at the end of the summer we were thinking of, uh, of having another. That would be third. Uh, well, because I think that uh, we always wanted a large family. And for all for different reasons, we we ended up with a smaller one, and I think it's our our kind of last 
attempt at having a medium-sized family. So three, when we were thinking about six, uh, is a compromise, but it's a good one, you know. Sadly, the wish wasn't fulfilled. And then two years later, tragedy struck. Early in January 2009, while the family were on holiday in the Bahamas, Jet, their 16-year-old son, died after a seizure. Their family attorney spoke to the press on behalf of the grief-stricken parents. Jet Travolta was happy every day of his life. Mr. and Mrs. Travolta were great parents, did all they could to make sure their children were happy, and we are deeply saddened at what occurred. Not only did the family have to deal with the grief, they also became embroiled in a bizarre extortion plot where three prominent Bahama citizens tried to gain millions from John, apparently around a refusal to transport document incorrectly signed when paramedics arrived to treat Jet, who suffered from autism. Even before they returned to the States, friends and members of the public brought food and floral tributes to the family home in Florida. And Tony Scott, who directed John in the 2009 remake of The Taking of Pelham 123, spoke of the tragedy at the film's premiere. No, I haven't. Like, I've, I've, you know, John's, he's, uh, I, I don't know how you recover, honestly, from something like that. I've got kids and um, I don't know if you ever recover or how you recover. Yeah. <laughs> Over the course of his 30-year film career, John has twice been nominated for an Oscar without success, but he has taken home plenty of other awards. In 1998, he was awarded the 8th Annual Britannia Award from the Los Angeles chapter of the British Academy of Film and Television Arts. The following year, his many fans recognized his work by giving him the World Artist Award at the Blockbuster Entertainment Awards. In 2004, he felt especially honoured to receive the Kirk Douglas Award for Excellence in Film at the Santa Barbara Film Festival. Well, because Mr. Douglas chose me, I'm particularly honoured and privileged. Uh, he's always been a very big um, uh, vocal protector of mine, meaning when I would cool off in my career, he would stand up and say this guy has talent and you know, he wrote about me in his book he, he his family always supported my endeavors uh, so I, I've always felt particularly uh, moved by by Kirk's um, care factor the LA Hollywood Film Festival Awards are viewed as the first important accolades of the year and John has been honored twice with a Lifetime Achievement Award and Supporting Actor and Ensemble Award for Hairspray Come on! Come on! Gay. Uh, minority kind of thing, secret little clubs and all. But when it, as soon as uh, Saturday Night Fever became a film, then everybody wanted to be a part of it. That's what made Studio 54 succeed. The following year, John was cast in the hit musical Grease, alongside the Australian Olivia Newton-John. Not only did the film give him another chance to bust some serious moves, it also showcased his great singing voice. In 1998, Paramount released a remastered version of the film and the stars reunited on the red carpet. For John, it felt like a lot of water had passed under the bridge. Well, it does feel like 20 years, i got to tell you. It doesn't feel like a short period of time. It feels like it was done a long time ago. But more than that, I think it's important that the kids get to see it on the big screen because our... <laughs>
John Travolta tripled sales of white suits in the 1970s, with his hip-thrusting turn as Tony Monero in the disco classic Saturday Night Fever, and electrified a generation of teenage girls as Danny Zuko in the big screen musical Grease. Before enduring a decade of flops in the 80s, he played Vinny in the popular TV sitcom Welcome Back Cotter. And then came his breakthrough hit, Saturday Night Fever, in 1977. Many years later, John acknowledged the impact the film had on his career. It was the first film um, that marked, kind of put me on the map, you know. I had done a movie called Carrie prior to that, but I think Saturday Night Fever was the one that solidified the, the idea that I could, I could stay. In 2005, an exhibition called Disco, A Decade of Saturday Nights opened at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts. It celebrated the Saturday night phenomenon, which had garnered the 24-year-old John Travolta a nomination for an Oscar. The real cultural significance of the disco period came into being with Saturday Night Fever, because before that it was a very underground... ...in the early 90s. He proved his resilience and hitched his way home from oblivion on the back of Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction in 1994, a comeback that didn't surprise his Pulp Fiction co-star, Harvey Keitel. The guy just exudes a certain joyfulness that is contagious. You feel good being around him. He's one of the most entertaining actors I've ever seen. John was born in New York City, the youngest child in a large middle-class family. His father was a football player turned salesman, and his mother an actress and singer who became a teacher. John got into music and acting early, and one of his first roles was as part of the touring company of Greece. In his late teens, he moved to L.A., and the 1970s were to prove hugely successful for the actor. Our generation, uh, for a year, got to see it, and that was the last time it was ever seen on the big screen. So why shouldn't, you know, all the generations since get to see it on the big screen? I, I think it's a good thing. John has continued his friendship with his co-star, and in 2006, he presented Olivia with her Lifetime Achievement Award at the Gadea Lay Australia Week Gala. He was invited back just two years later, this time to honor Australian chanteuse Kylie Minogue, who confesses that Grease is still her favorite film. John was on hand to present Kylie with her Excellence in Entertainment Award. However, he was quick to dispel rumors that he'd be joining Olivia in a duet. No. Do a duet. I will not tonight. I am not, I've not rehearsed. Now, if I 